There you go, Chip. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Studio City Neighborhood Council special board meeting. For March 29th, 2023, it is 7.06 p.m. and I'm calling this meeting to order. Abby, please take the roll. Sure. Um, Tim Clements, not here yet. Dean Cutler. Here. Fiona Duffy, absent. Randa Free, absent. Ira Gold. Here. Jeff Harwick. Here. Tilly Houlihan. Not here yet. Scott Mandel. Present. Chief Meehan. Here. Brandon Marino. Here. Richard Nitterberg. Not here yet. Ren Sorrow. Not here yet. Adele Slutter. Here. Adam Summer. Absent. Alexa Steinberg. Absent. Abby Velasco. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Let's move on to item two, the president's welcome. I'll be brief. A reminder to those attending during public comment, you may hear colorful language that some might find offensive. The SCNC has no ability to control or regulate the content of speech that is protected under the First Amendment. Board members are reminded not to cut off, interrupt, or otherwise engage with stakeholders during their allotted time. Contrary to what some of you have been told, I do not discourage anyone from making points of order, privilege, information, and so forth. However, many stakeholders, and some of you have informed me, that the formality can be off-putting. So as long as I'm chairing the meetings, a simple excuse me will suffice. That being said, we're going to go from, since Julie is not here, we're going to go instead from item three. We'll go right to item four, sustainability committee. Go ahead, Adele. Um, OK, sustainability committee motion. The board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council, SCNC, supports council file 23-0105 to revise the scope of work for the Sepulveda Basin Vision Plan so that it reflects the resolution referenced in the motion signed by more than 80 groups to center geomorphic restoration, climate adaptation, and community stability for the Sepulveda Basin Vision Plan. We also request that this motion be moved in an expedited fashion through the three city council committees. This motion is also to be submitted as a CIS to council file 23-23. 0105, and there's the link to that motion. Scott, if you add me, I can share. If you let me screen share, I can share them. Oh, sure. Sorry, Adele. Oh, that's great. That would be better. Then I don't have to. You are now, you are now co-host. Adele, did you have any, any context to add before we go to public comment, or do you want to do that? Um, this motion was brought to... Uh, the sustainability committee by we're on number four um by uh melanie winter who has done substantial work on the sepulveda basin and um really good work really really good work and i'm gonna let chip weigh in on this uh because i think he might be more articulate than i am uh well thank you um there are two competing visions Melanie and the River Project have a large consortium of like-minded, environmentally focused organizations. Their plan has um, more amenities in terms of playgrounds, open space, much more tree cover, much more vegetation, therefore habitat, much more adaptation in terms of um, uh, groundwater recapture where there will be basins that actually grab the water, put it down into the aquifer. Generally speaking, it's more of a nature-based solution. The other proposal has a whole bunch of pavement, a whole bunch of buildings, um, and in fact, less amenity for the community. Um, it's more of a built versus a landscaped environment. And that's also more of a, the hers is more of a habitat and water you know, dealing with water and open space and green, and theirs is more, um, this, 
yeah anyway it's just more paved and uh, not as friendly to people and na and uh, nature great so let's go to public comment on this agenda item you have one minute call in user one please unmute yourself Hi, it's Barry. Um, I'm just concerned by the last sentence, and I, I think it needs to be more specific. It says, we also request that this motion be moved in an expedited fashion through the three city council committees. What motion are you talking about in that sentence? The, the one to revise the scope of work, our actual motion, or, or what? I'm just confused by that sentence. And um, in, you know, if you're talking about the one, the motion that you're signing on to with the other 80 groups, it, it's it's going to go to those committees. It's not going to. The expedited fashion means nothing to those committees. So don't e if that's what you mean, don't even put that. Thank you. Jim, I, can, I can take timer duties if you want now. You're up, Ira. I was exhausted by the responsibility. Thank you. Anyone else from the attendee list? Raise your hand if you'd like to comment on this. Otherwise, back to the board. Public comment is closed. Chip, go ahead. Yeah, I, I buy what what Barry said, um, and I would offer a friendly amendment that we take the motion as it's currently written, but strike that last sentence. It also, um, it, it almost seems accusatory. It just seems antagonistic. I don't think we need to do that. I don't think it would actually uh, affect much. So I would take out that last, we also request that this motion be moved in an expedited fashion. I accept the friendly amendment. So you second it? I accept it. Accept. OK, we need a second. I'll, I'll second. second. Great. And then we go back to public comment on the amendment. Not seeing any hands. Back to the board. We can vote on the amendment. Brandon, has Brandon, uh, Brandon, go ahead, and then Chip. Yeah, question. Is there a reason why it needs to be expedited so quickly? Are we pressed for time here? Um, or is that just something you just, um, an urgency placed in the um, motion just to um, pop their eyebrows? I mean, is there a time, is there a, is there a time crunch? There's some politics behind this, Brandon, and Nuri Martinez was, behind the alternative proposal to this nature-based proposal. Um, there's a lot of rumors about the intent of that. Was this going to be a practice schedule, a practice facility for the Rams? I mean, there was all kinds of noise. This nature-based solution is slower because it was not her favorite, her favored solution. So that's one of the reasons that the nature-based solution folks feel that they're playing catch up. Um, so yes, it is urgent, but and I feel the urgency, but I agree with Barry that the language isn't going to get us there. Did I answer the question? Okay. Also, just to put yeah. it in context, uh, there was a lot of frustration, I would say, by certain people and that came out in that line. And I think that's why Chip's uh, agreeable. I mean, it could be said in a different way, but, and maybe also the three city council committees is kind of vague, but um, I, I don't think we need it. I don't think we need it. So, um, it, it, yeah. Great. Anyone else from the board have a comment on this? Due, due to the nature of the amendment and the motion, I think we should just go for a vote on the amended motion with the deletion of the last line. So let's, uh, absent any more hands, we can do that now. Call 
call for a vote, Abby? Oh. So we can vote. Fixing things here. Thank you. Uh, Kim Clements, absent. Dean Cutler? Yes. Fiona Duffy, absent. Randa Freed, absent. Ira Gold? Yes. Jeff Harwick? Yes. Julie Houlihan, absent. Scott Mandel? Yes. Chip Meehan. Yes. Brandon Marino. Yes. Richard Nutterberg, absent. Ren Soro, absent. Adele Slaughter. Yes. Adam Summer, absent. Alexa Steinberg, absent. Abby Velasco, yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, the next motion on sustainability is the Board of Studio City Neighborhood Council requests that Council President uh, Kokorian and council member Rahman. Should I do the first names? Oh, well, you can tell me later. Um, direct the Department of City Planning to immediately begin to review and update the open space element of the, of the city's general plan, SB 1425, signed by the governor last year, requires completion of the update by January 1st, 2026. The City of Los Angeles open space element plan was last written in 1973. An effort to update the open space element was launched in 2017 as our LA 2040, but was abandoned after less than a year. If Los Angeles is to meet the state deadline in just in a just inclusive and transparent manner, efforts to revive the process must begin as soon as possible. We believe it is achievable to meet our housing needs while preserving, enhancing, and expanding an integrated network of open space to support beneficial uses such as recreation, water sources, heat island reduction, habitat, and biodiversity and public health. This is to be submitted as a letter of a request for action to uh, council member, the council member Kokorian and uh, Paul Kokorian and council member Nithya Raman. Okay. Anything else in context before we go to public comment? I mean, all the links and everything in the motion are pretty self-explanatory if everyone checked the links. It's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, one of the, I just wanna say that one of the biggest issues we have right now, um, which we're gonna talk about later uh, after our next sustainability meeting is that, you know, sometimes development forgets about open space and green. And that is a very big problem for a city that just depends on, you know, the green open space that's in between the buildings. And we have to really push for that. And, um, you know, they, th there's a lot, a lot of times the city gives lip service to certain things and then sort of doesn't really follow up on it. And this is one of those examples where they said, oh, we're going to do this. Oh, and so that's why we're, we're, we want to bring attention to this, to this, to the city council. Great, thank you. We'll now go to public comment on the agenda item that you just heard. If you're a member of the public and would like to speak, please raise your hand and you will have one minute. Terry Austin, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Um, I'm in full support of this, um, following uh, some different um, uh, building issues, or not issues, but building plans over the last few years, a few years, uh, through uh, the FUM committee, it's shocking how many times developers are allowed to get away with concrete planters full of succulents as called open space. There's even, I've even seen examples where developers have been allowed to qualify uh, balconies footage as open space to count towards green open space if they put a plant on it. So um, it, 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 this is this, uh, this concept is being abused over and over again and the planning department and uh, whenever you attend any of their uh, meetings where they ask the public to chime in, they're always saying they're 30% understaffed. And it seems to be that right now the attitude is, well, we can't do as good a job as we should be doing. So let's just make a checklist and we'll check it off. And if it meets most of the checklist, we'll approve it. So they, there needs to be a little more, a uh, little, little bit- better time, please conclude your comments. Thank you, Ira. There needs to be better, I'm in support of it. There needs to be teeth in this. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much. Anybody else from the public, please raise your hand. Not seeing any hands, public comment is closed. Now onto the board. 
Go ahead, Brandon. Oh. Yeah, question. Um, LA's Green Deal plan, green, a new Green Deal plan, um, doesn't it, I, I have never read it, but doesn't it include the planting of trees, the um, protection of open space, um, anything like that? Because that plan still, um, they're still, they're still gunning for, um, I think it's 2030, I believe it is. Yeah. Is, is there any, is, is there any way that this can be folded into that? Like you guys have a green new deal plan. This should be a part of it. I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking out of my ears right now because it's not my realm, but um the green new deal plan does it um have anything to do with open space it's more of a grand plan uh for tackling climate change uh um yeah so not really and this was a this is a bill uh from the state you know and i'd also like to when the state actually this is my opinion, okay? But when the state actually does bills that are worth something, I'd like to support that, you know? And I think this is a good move, you know, statewide. But I mean, it's particularly a good move for Los Angeles, given all the, you know, all the uh, development that's on the horizon to that, for them to really think about what is the open space plan. And I don't think, I mean, sort of like, like what Terry loves to say is death by a thousand cuts. It's not just one way you know it's not just one thing that's going to help us you know save our tree canopy and get more green spaces in the city so and oh I, it's in other words it's not exclusive go ahead chip go ahead sorry yeah i i think brandon that the green new deal was more aspirational and i if i have this right and i may not that the open space plan actually has enforcement behind it and so what we have seen is <clears throat> since the original, <clears throat> we're seeing a disconnect between the rhetoric in front of the cameras, I'm all about green, and the reality behind the camera, which is the developers get their say because there's no legislation, there's no ordinance that can stop them from doing that, or the ordinances that are there are riddled with holes. So this, I believe, is setting up the framework for new regulations that would ensure the delivery of the open space plan. I think that's the difference. So pretty much if I remember this correctly, the state is forcing cities and municipalities to get their act together and comply with these plans. And what we're asking the city council to do is get a jump on this before the state legislation forces them to do it. And there's no time like now, like the present, to get on with these, um, with these uh, uh, guidelines. And they started it, apparently, um, they did start it. And in 2017, they dropped it because they were fighting for so much fight, infighting. So, you know, it's time to stop fighting and, and come together on some kind of a plan, right? Great, are we ready to vote? Any more hands? No hands, let's vote. Okay, we're voting on item 4B, Kim Clements. Um, I think she just got here, so. She yeah, she did, you need to add her. She just arrived a yeah, few minutes ago. So, but I don't hear her, is she? Can you hear me now? Yes. I, I said I'm gonna have to abstain since I just joined a moment ago and I'm trying to get settled, sorry, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dean Cutler. Yes. Fiona Duffy is absent. Brenda Freed, absent. Ira Gold. Yes. Jeff Harwick. No. Second. One second. My mouse is not cooperating. There we go. Um, Julie Hullihan, absent. Scott Mandel. Yes. Chip Meehan. Yes. Brenda Marino? Yes. Richard Nitterberg is absent. Rensero is absent. Adele Slutter? Yes. Adam Summers absent. Alexa Steinberg absent. Abby Velasco, yes. Uh, so we only, we have two, I guess motion passes seven, 
seven yeses, one no, one abstain. Let's do yep. the majority of what we're here. Correct. Simple okay, majority. Passes. Okay. Um, C, the Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports Council File 23-0141 to direct the planning department in concert with other supporting agencies to prepare a report with recommendations to streamline the permitting, the permitting of ground mounted solar installations as currently described in the LAMC 12.24.U.7. This motion is to be submitted as a CIS Council File 23-0141, and there is the link. Any hey, additional Chip. context? Uh, Can we Chip? do this? Yeah, yeah, so we've had this legislation that actually re that governs the permitting of solar installations has been around for a couple of years. We're more familiar with roof mounted installations like on the houses and the buildings in the neighborhoods. Ground mounted is somewhat different and has different applications. Um, as this, as ground mounted programs have been put together, it's discovered that the language was sort of getting in the way of speedy and just uh, city governance. So, for example, if you were to have a project that was a series of a couple miles of streetlights, each of which were independently powered by a solar panel at the top of the pole, and that sort of powered the streetlight. It was not hooked up to the grid. Each one under the current legislation, each one of those poles would need to get its own basically environmental impact report, as opposed to saying, in a blanket fashion, this project is intended to do this, and then one report would cover the entire project. So just by dint of the fact that there are some specificities in the language which are in conflict with common sense, the request is, now that you've been out here doing this for a while, and these cases have come forward where the law doesn't do what it was intended to do, what would you do to modify the legislation so it was more effective in a common sense area? And within the legislation, there are still strong provisions that um, individual environmental impact reports need to be called into, need to be required in cases where hillside homes, you know, all the places where you would want to have property and personal safety was there. It's a question of asking them to straighten the law out now that they have more familiarity with it. Thank you for that. We will now go to public comment on the item you just heard, ground mounted solar. Call in user number two, you have a minute, please unmute yourself. Whoever did this agenda, you did a very good job. A lot of supporting and so forth. Whoever did it, congratulations. All this asks for is a report. That means it's going to be implemented. Don't forget, you have to have the infrastructure to start it. That means the um, CMS, uh, that's the computer system. You have to have people. And uh, you have to know what the fiscal study is on how much this shit's going to cost and, and also any enforcement. So you're just voting that you're. Uh, Voting for a report, which is nothing controversial. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Not seeing any additional hands from the public. Back to the board. Anyone have any comments, questions before we vote? Not Jeff Hartwick, go ahead. Oh, someone in the. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. Yeah, I just have a few concerns. I I uh, attended via via Zoom or YouTube rather the uh, sustainability committee meeting on this, and uh, there were some concern concerns raised about, you know, what exactly is ground mounted. Uh, I mean, are they going to be able to put ground mounted panels all over the, the hillsides near the Hollywood sign? Um, 
Does it mean our neighbor is going to be able to put ground mounted solar panels instead of a lawn? So I, I know it calls for a report, but it's really the impetus behind this is to streamline the process to uh, more easily give permitting for ground mounted solar, whatever that is. I mean, Chip, you talked about mounting up on a on a pole or something, but ground mounted implies ground mounted, you know, as a as a, a clear definition. So, I have concerns about the whole issue of of streamlining ground mounted. It means giving it a rubber stamp, and you know, there are other considerations that need to be taken into account, such as aesthetics um, and character of the neighborhood. So. I don't think this is uh, something that needs to be streamlined. Uh, I can see a report, but the report kind of pushes it in the direction of streamlining the whole process. So I, I just don't think it's something that uh, we need at this time. Thank you. Brandon. Thank you. Um, there are some homes, some older homes that cannot get um, roof mounted solar. The roof won't be able to handle it. I have a few friends who've been wanting to get solar panels for a while and their homes are from the 1940s and installers say can't do it. And they really want solar energy to reduce the cost of their DWP bills, but I think the only other option would be like building some structure out in the back and then putting the panels on there. But um, piggybacking on um, Jeff's point. Yeah, I mean. If you live on the hillside, I know it's supposed to protect um, open space and um, native trees. It's in the um, motion that those should not be infringed upon. But, you know, by the time this gets passed, maybe solar panel energy will get to the point where you don't need as many solar panels to um, um, harvest as much energy as we do now. So based on how the city operates, it might be a few years. So. I'm not, I'm not against the, uh, seeing what they see in a report. <clears throat> well, because in the motion also, it does talk about safeguarding, you know, some of the dangers. And we happen to have um, Alexander Black, who's installed uh, ground mounted solar panels. And he said, you have to really be careful to not install it so that it kills everything like artificial turf does underneath it, you know, and so he does do that. So I don't, I mean, and he was for this uh, motion since he knows more about it than all of us. I think uh, it it does make sense to streamline it, and and that's just part of the government's ridiculous, um, you know, making everything more complicated than it needs to be. Um, I don't think they're going to streamline it so much that they will do dangerous things. I, I can't imagine that. So I share Jeff's concerns. I'm sure whatever the city is going to do to screw something up, they're going to do it. Uh, however, I'm always or almost always in support of report backs. And then my preference would be to critique the report. So I'm gonna be in favor of this chip and then Kim. Yeah, I'm completely with Jeff. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, I was always from a policy standpoint, very much in favor of um, of solar, and particularly when my son was going to Boulder for two years, when I drove out there a couple of times, I mean, I was just taken by how god awful ugly they are. <laughs> um, and I mean, aesthetically, it really is a problem with you know all of these alternative energy plants is that they're disruptive. Um, I think it's possible that the report back on the potential for streamlining could come back and say it is what it is. I mean, that one outcome is it's as streamlined as it can get if we're still going to follow the simultaneous path of not just providing clean energy, but also preserving the aesthetic, preserving wildlife and that sort of thing. Maybe it's not possible, um, but it seems that there was enough of a roster of projects that were seemingly unreasonably delayed that it prompted the motion. So I would just like to see what they had to say about it because the report back is not changing anything. It's just more of an investigation. That was my that was my hope, Jeff. Kim? 
Thanks. Um, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up, Jeff, because I had similar thoughts and concerns as well. Um, and I'm having a tough time deciding on this one because, in fact, just on the way home tonight, I was thinking these reports, they, they do tie up resources and they cost money. So basically, if you're going to ask for a report, it, it, you know, at least be wanting whatever it is that you're asking them to report on. So I sort of feel that by asking for this report, we are asking for, obviously we are, we're asking for the streamlining of it, but before that gets done, you want a report. So it is it is kind of sending the message that we are in favor of these things. And, and I'm just not certain on this myself. So I'm not sure I want to even vote for the report. Uh, but thank you for bringing the points up, both Scott and Jeff. I think you're both sort of sitting where I am a little bit, but all for streamlining government regulations. So this is a tough one. Thanks. Dean? Um, I don't know who can answer, but um, maybe Chip. Is there criteria in place, design criteria or anything? I mean, we are talking about a report to deal with streamlining the process, um, but if all the checks and balances are there and like a plan checker is everything's meeting the code or the criteria, then it moves forward. Um, we're not seemingly changing the criteria, whatever criteria has been adopted for these um, ground mounted uh, installations, are we? The, and again, there were people that were in the committee meeting that were more informed than Adele and I on this, but as I understand it, the individual ground mounted solar arrays fall into the same regulation bucket as any other power generating facility. So it's sort of, it's looked at like it's a power plant. Um, and some of that seems to be unnecessary in the construction of some of these. That was the one piece and the other piece had to do with taking, not looking at projects as a whole. I can't answer the question better than that. I'm sorry, Dean. No, I, I appreciate that. Just, I think we're trying to understand more about what we're getting as opposed to as it, as it moves across the counter. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have a comment or a question before we vote? Not seeing any, let's vote on this. Okay, we're voting on item 4C. Kim Clements. Yes. Dean Cutler. No. Uh, Fiona Duffy, absent. Brenda Freed, absent. Ira Gold. No. Jeff Hartwick. No. Nope. Julie Houlihan is absent. Scott Mendel. A, a very soft yes. Chip Meehan. Yes. Brandon Marino. Yes. Richard Nitterberg is absent. Rincero is absent. Adele Slutter. Yes. Adam Summers, absent. Alexa Steinberg, absent. Abby Velasco, yes. That means we have one, two, three, four, five, six yes, three no's. Motion passes. Okay. Um, where are we now? Sorry. Oh. Mm -hmm. D. Uh, uh, the Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports council file 15-0499-S2, biodiversity protection, urban forest, tree canopy coverage, sustainable built environment, tree placement, tree removal, land use, environmental review. It has been over the two and, it is, that's a mistake. It has been over two and a half years since uh, the August 12th, 2020 request for a report back. And there's been ex extensive substantial loss to the Los Angeles tree urban canopy. The urban canopy is a valuable appreciating ur urban infrastructure asset and its degradation is irresponsible and seriously impacts the quality of life in Los Angeles. 
The Studio City Neighborhood Council requests an update on the report back and encourages the immediate enforcement of all existing tree protection ordinances. We also request an accounting of all exceptions granted in the planting, planning process that allowed tree removal in the 2020, 2021, and 2022 window in an effort to understand the nature of the damage. It is critical to have ongoing public accounting of exceptions to tree protection ordinances to allow ready investigation by the community. It is imperative that our community preserve our protected and significant mature trees. This motion is also to be submitted as a CIS to council file 15-0499-S2. So there is a typo. It has been over, not the, it has been over strike the uh, two and a half years. So sorry. There's a second typo as well in that third paragraph, that fourth line up, the word should be public. Where is it? I can't see it. The, that bottom paragraph, there you go, public. Uh, I'm looking, I'm looking. That's to have ongoing public accounting. It's missing the L, you're on okay. the word. Okay. Okay, thank you. Very good. Uh, okay. Any context before we go to public comment? Or um, I mean, it's pretty, um, I think the biggest context, which is gonna come up in the next motion, I believe, is the, um, the, you know, the protected tree ordinance says it's a protected tree ordinance, but it's, it's really doesn't protect anything. It, what it does is basically allow people to cut down a tree if they're willing to replace it, either one to one or one to four, depending on the tree. So, and so there's been a lot of devastation in the tree canopy in Los Angeles. I mean, it's gone down significantly, even in Studio City it's gone down significantly. And um, we, you know, this um, motion was, uh, was written two and a half years ago and, and nothing, and it was asked for a report back and there's nothing's happened and more trees are coming down. So we thought that if we were to push for a report back for them to actually look at the devastation there could be some movement in. Um... Can I point of information, Adele? Here, yeah, um, uh, Mr. President. Sure. There was actually a um, a city council vote on five twenty seven twenty twenty two, and it was passed. But that the vote on May twenty seventh twenty twenty two was to ask for the report, and I think what Adele is saying is, since the council action on May twenty seventh twenty twenty two, there has been no report. Correct. Correct. Okay, so there was action on it but nothing came of it. Correct. Okay, just wanted to know. Just thank you, thanks for the clarification. Very good. Uh, we can go to public comment and then back, unless you had a, uh, just more context now or for discussion, let's hold off. Call on user two on what we just discussed or we heard presented. Please unmute yourself, you have one minute. Always devil in the details. What this board has stated on its face on the motion, no problem. But let me tell you why there's not a report. As part of the strategic plan, they only want to use certain type of uh, uh, trees to replace. So if you cut down one thing, you can only use certain ones. Now the problem with that was there was the ones that they wanted to use. A agricultural company in the Midwest owns the patent on that particular so-called DNA tree. So you would have to purchase from that business that particular tree. They were worried about antitrust price gouging issues. That's why you're not getting the report because there's no way to get around that. So that's a very small detail that has never been really brought forth. Everything else that's been said, I, I get it. But that's why the report hasn't been done because uh, that's time. they're Please afraid. Your comments. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Anyone else from the public? Please raise your hand. Not seeing any more hands. Public comment is closed. Back to the board. Any hands, questions? Not seeing anyone. Uh, I think we're ready to vote on this. Okay. Uh, Kim Clements. Yes. Dean Cutler. Yes. Fiona Duffy is absent. Randall Freed absent. Ira Gold. Yes. Jeff Harwick. Yes. Julie Houlihan. Yes. Scott Mandel. Yes. Kit Meehan. Yes. Brenda Marino. Yes. Richard Nitterberg, absent. Rencero, absent. Adele Slaughter. Yes. Adam Summer is absent. Alexa Steinberg, absent. Abby Velasco, yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, my last motion. The Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports Council File 03-1459-S3 to strengthen and amend the city's protected tree ordinance number 177404 as detailed in the motion introduced by council mem members Paul Koretz and Mike Bonin on November 22nd, 2017. Clearly protected trees are too easily removed under the quote unquote protected tree ordinance leading to significant losses throughout Los Angeles in recent years. Ecosystems Ecosystem services provided by trees are essential for our city, particularly as we confront the impacts of climate change. A strong ordinance is critical in the conservation and preservation of trees and the wildlife habitat these trees support. We request an update on the progress of strengthening and amending this critical ordinance. This motion is to be uh, also to be submitted as a CIS to Council File um, 03-1459-S3. And this is um, context, this is a continuation really of that last motion, but more specifically to strengthen the protected tree ordinance because it is, it is very weak and not, I mean, I'm not even sure it's enforced. I mean, I know it's not enforced, so. Well, that reminds me of the, uh, the property I mentioned to land use and sustainability on Mulholland Drive where it said, in the findings that there are no protected trees being removed for this development. And further into the report, it said, there are no protected trees because all of the trees were clear cut. All the protected trees were clear cut. Before. By the applicant. Yeah, so that's so much for the protected tree ordinance. Call in user two, please unmute yourself. You have one minute. I don't mind this motion, but as a practical matter and administrative matter, anytime you want something to be updated or strengthened in the motion, provide a copy of the proposed ordinance or proposed motion. That's how you do it. So if I'm in court and I need to uh, propose something, I do my motion, plus I have the draft copy attached to be approved. That's how you do it. This is just saying stuff, but as you know, the city doesn't follow through and they don't have the staff, but if you provide 99% of the workload already done, you're able to move stuff forward. So like if I'm up in Sacramento and I want to amend a, a bill or, or a proposed bill, I will say, this is my proposed amendment. Here's a copy of it, all formatted and everything. I'm always available. If you guys need me to do legislative drafting, I've done it for other neighborhood councils, and th that's pretty much it. But uh, that's time. Uh, thank okay, thank time. you. Can I ask a question of our of uh, Richard? Uh, can I ask him a question? Well, no. You you can clarify something, but uh, well, I well yeah. Then we'll, then we just go back to public comment again. Being the number of attendees, go ahead. We're fine. My question, you know, that you uh, point well taken, and I, I will um, email you when I need that. Um, but in the motion that we're referencing, the CS file, it does have a very clear um, path forward, 
you know, talking about this, the city's protected tree yard ordinance being stronger, so, so on and so forth. So I don't know, I thought that would be enough, but um, you're, you're saying to do, what, I guess my question to you, Richard, is you're saying to do more than that? So we'll go back to public comment. Everyone from the public now has a chance to raise your hand again, if you so choose for one more minute. Uh, call on user two, go ahead. Okay, uh, as to your direct question, the, the, the problem, I'm not penalizing you on your writing or your grammar skills. The issue is you have to have absolutes. If something gets cut off, is it there's a straight monetary or is it can it be a misdemeanor? There's a lot for what I've reviewed, uh, some of that's very silent and it's more administrative. So the b best way when you deal with a bureaucrat is do most of their work for them. You're able to get a better response rather than saying, I'll get back to you later and so forth. You've probably dealt with that with done and then you still get no answer. So the key thing is to limit their time exposure to do all their work for them and let them uh, say that how great they are. So it, it, it's up to you what you want to do. Any other uh, clarification you need, ma'am? No, thank you so much. I got it. Thank you. Oh, uh, I will send to uh, Scott a couple drafting manuals, unless Scott already has them, so you get at least an understanding. Minutes. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you for that. Anybody else from the public? Please raise your hand, not seeing any more hands. Back to the board. Questions, comments before we vote? Jeff, go ahead, please. I took a look at the ordinance and it references uh, 177404. There was a, a subsequent ordinance which modified it, ordinance 186873. It says effective 20, uh, 2021. So the ordinance that you're referencing in this motion actually has been subsequently modified. I'm not sure which modification occurred to that ordinance. And looking at the, the actual ordinance, it's called section 46. It is a misdemeanor offense for a person to remove a tree illegally. So that's already in the law. There's also a permit application fee of $805 per tree plus a, a non-refundable inspection fee of $2,900 per tree. So, I mean, there are mechanisms in the law already that deal with the situation. I think the problem with non-enforcement is with the city attorney's office. The city attorney is not prosecuting many crimes, including violent crimes. Same with our district attorney. So I think the problem lies with the prosecutors who, who are in charge of our city and our county uh, rather than the ordinance itself, because I do believe it does have a proper mechanism to deal with these situations. That's why I have to add, thanks. Um, just, I would say, and I'm happy to go back and work on this a little bit more, maybe with Richard Hopp, uh, because I don't think, I know that sounds like a lot of money, almost $3,000, but I don't, it's not, the developers are not caring about that. They're just cutting trees down. And some of them are cutting them down without even telling or without even, you know, going through the process of paying for them. And some of them are paying for them and cutting them down. So um, I'd be happy to uh, table this and go back and uh, work on it. Um, with Richard, with Richard Hop and Chip, if you if you feel like you want to do that, that's not a problem. Go ahead, Brandon. You mentioned um, around eight hundred dollars per tree. You said, where does the money go? Does it go to planting more trees? Does the money go back into our green environment to sustain it or protect it or maintain it? Uh, if if I'm a developer. And um, I want to chop down a bunch of trees. I wouldn't because I do love trees and wildlife. But um, let's say I'm just some evil developer. I just want to just destroy all the trees. And each one costs, say, let's say $1,000, just round it up. And there's 10 trees. That'd be $10,000. Where's it go? Where's the money go? 
Well, some of it goes to an in lieu fee. I think that the, the $2,900 per tree goes to an in lieu fee, meaning the, that is money that's supposed to be uh, used to plant trees elsewhere in the city. But that in lieu fee number got really, really big. And there was a big scandal where one of our people in, took a lot of that money to do to do to plant street trees, which were, were not what was not where that money was supposed to go. It wasn't supposed to go into street trees. And that uh, department took that a lot of that money. And they were um, Kim would really dislike this because they were um, you know, saying that they needed a lot of money to water the tree, which, you know, if you, if you plant a coast live oak, it doesn't need as much water, it's drought tolerant, and it doesn't take as much water to keep it going. So they were, it was a very sketchy thing. So, but that money, the in lieu fee money has been sitting around and not nothing much has been uh, done with it. So that's part of the, I mean, it's, it's, it's an unraveling of a huge problem. Um, so and I'm happy to, I mean, if you guys want me to work on this a little more, and I'm happy to do that and maybe get more specific about what, as what Richard said, is more specific about what we want the city to do. Yeah, I think that's a, a good idea. I do too. So, so I, given that we haven't encountered this that I recall that was not uh, sort of I think I can pull the motion. Yeah. I think. Well, I mean, just to, so we tidy it up. I mean, the, when we've done this before, it was adversarial and then we we moved to send it back to committee and then voted on it. But uh, who, who's the parliamentarian here? Help me out. Do we just uh, I think, let Adele pull I think, it? Or I think I can pull it and say, I'll, 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 I'll table it. Is it, is it tabling that you do? No, Tell you're, send, you're sending it back to committee. That I'll table it to another time. Okay. And I'll work on it. And I think that's a good idea. Chip, are you, are you good with that? Well, I would never want to actually, with my salesman background, say, no, don't give me the order. So my initiative wouldn't have been, I would take it back until I heard no, just as a matter of genetic. Yeah, but I, I can, I feel yeah, like yeah. I, mean, I so want well, we've already Adele, done Adele, you can you you can bring this motion back. It could be renewed, even though even if it's voted down, you can renew it and bring it back at a sub at a um, subsequent um, board meeting. It's not dead if it's voted down. You can change it and bring it back. It's possible. That's that's well within the rules. Yeah, but I want now. I want a better motion. Okay, but I think that so let's go take the points. Then we want to figure out one of the questions that was asked that I thought was a good one from Brandon is where does the money go? Mm -hmm. The other thing that we have encountered as we've gone through this. And you'll see a number of these which are seemingly similar. And what we're finding out is like there's greenwashing all over, right? Like um, you all the electeds are talking about how in favor of anything green they are, there's no legislation or ordinances to back it up. And what we're finding out even is when there are ordinances, which may not be that much of a deterrent because over a $200 million project, a couple tens of thousands for tree removal to expedite the project isn't really, it's just the cost of doing business. But there also are black holes. So there are a number of places like the, some of the places that we're looking at along Lancashire, I'm sorry, along Ventura between Colfax and Tahunga, the project will take out a bunch of trees there isn't room on the site to replace the trees. So that balance of trees owed the city for the ones that are removed are held in account. No one really knows where that goes. So someplace there is a spreadsheet that has trees that are owed to the city by developers, but it's never enforced. So we'll straighten out that part of the back room as well for next month. Okay. So it's pulled. We don't have to vote on it. Right? Do do we want to make a make it official and then I move to send this back to committee? Do I have a second? Then we vote and then it's all tied. I, th I think she can just withdraw it. Okay. Let's do it. 
Although, although it, I mean, it passed through, it passed through. So maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, fine. We, out of an abundance of caution, we can vote. I mean, <laughs> Anyone have a comment on that? Um, sure why don't, why don't, why don't you just go ahead and say I table it and then yeah. say, say I'll table it. I table it. And then I'll, I'll second it and then. We can all vote on that. We can vote on that. And then just call a vote. So at least we're official. That'll work. That should work. Second. Uh, Jeff seconded. Got it. So we're voting on tabling. Tabling item 4E, Kim Clements. Yes. Uh, yes. Dean Cutler. Yes. Fiona Duffy is absent. Randa Freed absent. Ira Goal. Yes. Jeff Harwick. Yes. Julie Hillihan. Yes. Scott Mandel. Yes. Chip Meehan. Yep. Uh, Brenda Marino. Yes. Richard Nitterberg is absent. Ren Saro is absent. Adele Slutter. Yes. Adam Summer is absent. Alexa Steinberg absent. Abby Velasco. Yes. Motion passes to table it. Thank you, Adele. Now on to Julie. It's all yours. Take it away. All right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, Ira, are you still going to keep sharing screen? Thank you for doing that. It's so helpful. Um, so we have a few motions from the Homeless Committee, and um, I just want to preface it by saying that, you know, since Mayor Bass has gotten elected, a lot of stuff has gotten fast tracked. A lot of motions were introduced and voted on very quickly. So some of these motions uh, have already passed. I think four out of five of them have already passed, but we are still weighing in on them. Uh, in at least one case, we oppose what they said. So we'll still get our two cents in and we'll have it there for the record. So uh, we'll just start with the, the first motion. The Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports Council File 22-1545 in which the LA City Council supports Mayor Bass's declaration of a local emergency with regard to homelessness, if amended to include these two key performance indicators. A, a decrease in the number of homeless individuals who are service resistant and an increase in the number of 4118 designation zones. This motion is also to be submitted as a separate community impact statement to council file 22-1545. So you can see there we did do a, a small amendment to add um, some accountability there. I think it's self-explanatory, but uh, please comment or ask questions and we can go through it. Uh, I agree. Anyone, we'll go to public comment first. Anybody from the public? Have anything to say about the motion you just heard read? Raise your hand. Not seeing any hands. Public comment is closed. Back to the board. Any comments? Great. I think we can go to a vote. Let's vote. Yes. No. Can we go to a vote? Okay. Yes. Voting on item three A. Kim Clements. Yes. Dean Cutler. Yes. Fiona Duffy is absent. Randa Freed absent. Ira Gold. Yes. Jeff Harwick. Yes. Julie Houlihan. Yes. Scott Mandel. Yes. Pete Meehan. Yep. Brenda Marino. Yes. Richard Niederberg is absent. Rensero is absent. Adele Slaughter. Yes. Adam Summer is absent. Alexa Steinberg absent. Abby Velasco, yes. Motion passes. Great. Motion B. The Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council opposes Council File 23-0033, brought by CD2's Paul Krikorian and CD4's Nithya Rahman, 
the legislation supports Mayor Bass's declaration of a local emergency and establishes a bank account, which the mayor administrates. The motion provides funding of more than $50 million from various existing accounts that were already dedicated to homelessness and requires weekly reporting from agencies, including Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, LASA, LA Housing Department, Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles, and the Department of Transportation. Reports include status updates on homeless outreach and engagements, referrals and placements, expenditures, and other metrics and data. Updates on the Inside Safe Initiative and related matters. Uh, this motion is also to be submitted as a separate community impact statement to Council File 23003. So the, the only comment I'll have about that is we did have an interesting discussion in our committee about this um, because, and I'll say that this, this passed, this is already done. She has $50 million that she can spend and she can bypass some of the roadblocks that I think a lot of people in the homeless industry feel that they have in terms of making uh, forward progress. And I think, you know, we're all reading the news and we're seeing what she's doing. Um, I think, you know, so there's definitely people in the committee that object to giving the mayor $50 million and sort of carte blanche to spend it on what she wants to spend it on. And, and that was the majority of our committee. And that's, uh, that's why we voted to oppose this motion. Now I'll open it up to comments. Thank you, Julie. Uh, we're on to public comment now on what you just heard about homelessness and the $50 million. Anyone from the public, please raise your hand. Not seeing any hands onto the board. Any board questions, comments before we vote? Another self-explanatory motion. Thank you. We can vote on this one. Every voting on item 3B. Kim Clements. Yes. Jim Cutler. Yes. Fiona Duffy is absent. Rhonda Freed absent. Ira Gold. Yes. Jeff Harwick. Yes. Julie Houlihan. Yes. Pat Mandel. Yes. Chip Meehan. Yes. Brandon Marino. Yes. Richard Nitterberg is absent. Rancero is absent. Adele Slaughter. No. No. Okay. Adam Summer is absent. Alexa Steinberg absent. Abby Velasco, yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. Next motion. The Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports Council File 23-0104 to establish a small housing provider assistance program to provide payment directly to housing providers who incurred debt due to rental arrears during the course of the pandemic and report on program parameter recommendations. The fund would provide rental debt assistance for the small and local housing providers in this city who otherwise may never recover lost rental income. Can point we... of order, point of order. Yeah, we went did out we, of order. Did we skip D? Yeah, we, we skipped uh, a couple here. That was my fault. Sorry, I didn't realize that. Oh, thank you. I thought it was just me. Should we go? Should we go to D? Wait a minute. I don't think we did C. We didn't do C. Yeah, we're on C. We're on C. Right. Thank you, Brandon. Okay. Motion C. The Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports Council File 22-0928 which requires Los Angeles Homeless Service Authority, LASA, to release monthly reports for one year following any place-based intervention in the city involving more than 10 unhoused individuals, such as an encampment with 10 or more people. The reports would detail those who were placed in housing, what type of housing, who did not receive housing, or return to the streets. The Studio City Neighborhood Council respectfully requests more transparency on the number of permanent support housing units and interim housing beds within the SPA 2 service planning area boundaries and the occupancy rates of these facilities 
on an ongoing periodic basis, either monthly or at least quarterly. These reports should be available electronically. This motion is also to be submitted as a separate community impact statement to council file 22-0928. Um, so because I stumbled a little bit, I just wanna say, yeah, if, if there's 10 or more people, they're required to report what happened to those people. And you know, on top of that, we're saying, we'd like to know, like sometimes we have uh, council district people come on and they'll tell us how many beds there are but it feels like the public doesn't really have access to that information. And it'd be nice to have that information on a website or somewhere. I know that they have told me that that's a difficult thing to keep up with. It would almost be a daily tally. So we did, I've talked to them about that and there's a little bit of pushback, but I think a lot of people feel like that should be a, a service that's provided. So that's part of that motion. Thank you. We'll go to public comment now. Any members from the public, please raise your hand. Not seeing any hands. Back to the board. Comments, questions, hands. So uh, can I just ask a question? I'm jumping in. I didn't raise my hand. But um, is, it, is this like a way of humanizing the homeless people so that we know, oh, so-and-so, you know, got a room and or got a place to live and they're still living there and they're is that what your goal is? Uh, they know, the people that are working with them know who they are. They're not allowed to tell you who they are, mm -hmm. but it's a way of, for example, just keeping up with, with what's happening to people because they might disperse from one area and land in another area or just keep being displaced. So it's a way of saying, we know who these people are and what's happening to them. It's an accountability measure. Mm. So I guess, yes, <laughs> thinking about your question, yeah. Chip? Yeah, just when Julie talked about the pushback she's getting on the burden of daily reporting, the hair in the back of my head stood up. Um, you know, in my professional career, I never had a moment when a superior could sit there and say, what are you doing and how successful are you at it? It wasn't my option to say, you know something, I'll get back to you later. <laughs> I mean, I think that this is the absolutely part of the job on a daily basis. They should be having an activity report. And I think it's part of the accountability for where is the money being spent how successful are the programs? Um, and, you know, without that kind of accountability, without the metric for success, I don't know how you do anything other than just cash a check every month, every week. You can't judge the project success unless you have feedback on performance. It's crazy. One of the many, yeah, I was going to add, one of the many criticisms of LASA and LA Family Housing was the fact that they were they have been very secretive even about uh, uh, information that it does not have any personal identifying uh, characteristics to it, and one of the issues that the public was getting frustrated with were the vacancies in all of the the tiny homes, the shelters, the bridge homes, and so forth, uh, and it seemed to indicate that people were being either service resistant or they just didn't want to go into these facilities. And the transparency, as Chip was mentioning, and of course, Julie, sort of lets us know what, what it is they're doing and what's working and what's not working. This is not a secret and it shouldn't be a secret. We're not asking for social security numbers and the list of medications people are taking. And the, the city council, as we've seen from previous meetings, we're, they're all asking for a report back on things that have been in place for years. And even the uh, Board of Supervisors was quoted, uh, Janice Hahn said, everything we've tried so far has not worked. So I think this is this is well-written and I, I completely agree with, with what we're asking for. And I hope we can get it. Uh, anybody else? Someone said in our meeting, and I can't verify it personally, but that there at one point was a reporting system, but it was just so badly bungled that they scrapped it. But if there was a, 
of electronic system in place, it doesn't seem that hard if you're uh, managing a tiny home facility just at the end of the day to go, we have three beds tonight. We have six beds tonight. That doesn't seem that hard. Agreed. Any other comments, questions? Let's vote. Okay, we're voting on item 3C. Kim Clements. Yes. Dean Cutler. Yes. Fiona Duffy is absent. Randa Freed absent. Ara Gold. Yes. Jeff Harwick. Yes. Julie Hullihan. Yes. Scott Mandel. Yes. Meehan. Yep. Brenda Marino. Yes. Richard Nitterberg is absent. Rencero is absent. Adele Slutter. Yes. And Adam Summer is absent. Alexa Steinberg absent. Abby Velasco, yes. Motion passes. Great. All right, motion D. The Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council opposes Council File 21-0042-S5, which requires landlords to provide three months rent and moving expenses to tenants when rent is raised more than either 10% or consumer price index plus 5% over 12 months, whichever is lesser. This does not apply to small landlords who own a single family dwelling unit and no more than four additional dwelling units. This motion is also to be submitted as a separate community impact statement to council file 21-0042-S5. So this gets into a, a little bit of math here, um, but I guess what we figured out was that it would be easy enough for a landlord to the rents three grand a month um, to pay somebody nine grand plus moving expenses, which I think in the motion is about 14, between 14, 1500 bucks. So for 10 grand, they can just sort of push somebody out and raise the rent however much they they want. It's, it sounds initially like it's good for the consumer, right? If you get booted, you get this moving expenses, but it also seems like a situation where landlords could, you know, the big landlords could take advantage of that situation. I think there were some other arguments uh, against it too, but it, it's, it's another one of those council file things where it's sort of like sticking it to the big guy um, that they tend to like to do. So that's my pontification there. I'll open it for comments. Thank you. Anyone from the public would like to comment on this? Please raise your hand. Not seeing any hands raised, back to the board. Jeff Hartwick, go ahead, please. Yeah, this, this motion is kind of crazy. Um, inflation right now is around 6%. So if you, you know, and the landlords are getting hammered by inflation as well, uh, especially the, the cost of utilities. Um, so if they raise rent, uh, 10% and, you know, inflation is 6%, you know, they're going to get hammered here and it only applies to four more units, but, you know, there are complexes owned by moms and pops that are like six units. So then they're going to get hammered. Um, I just don't think it's the role of government to be interfering into contracts between, uh, landlords and tenants and, um, also, the, the motion that follows, um, I, I read that uh, renters got $1.6 billion in, in assistance from the city of LA during the pandemic. And they've done some provisional audits and a lot of it, there's a lot of fraud, waste and abuse. Um, a lot of landlords couldn't evict problematic tenants. Um, so I think this is sticking to landlords um, unnecessarily. Uh, and uh, I really don't think that uh, this motion should pass. Thank you. Adele. Um, Wait, let, me let me rephrase it. We should um, support this motion opposing the council file. Right. Adele, go ahead. So, <laughs> so 
um, I'm confused by what Jeff said because I have the exact opposite reason for supporting this motion than he has, which is they're not asking enough of the landlord, which is what I heard you say, Julie. Am I wrong? In other words, they're asking so little of the landlord that landlords could easily, um, you know, kick people out and raise the rent to a higher rate, you know, uh, yeah. and just pay $10,000 or whatever, you know. I think they can both be true. <laughs> right. Because, uh, like, I don't have a problem sticking it to the landlords because they make a lot of money. And they also are abusive often to the tenants. Not always, but often. So, um, but I think I'm confused now. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm being literal or something, but can someone help me out? Uh, Brandon, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why this motion's here because it's already an ordinance. Um, according to the council file on 327-2023, just two days ago, final ordinance number 187764, it's, it's law now, according to the council file. So um, there's not much more we can do about this. It looks like an ordinance adding section 165.09 to article five chapter blah 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 to require payment of specified relocation assistance it looks like it's already in there they fast track this right so, it, um, it is like some of these motions are already passed it's just us weighing in on them so you're okay. right dean i just want to comment on something that adele said um you know not every landlord um, can withstand unlimited, um, you know, rent compression. And there are operating expenses, as Jeff said. Utilities have gone up. Um, labor, wages, the trash, the city runs the trash system. It used to be multiple vendors. Now there's one vendor. It's a monopoly. So all the trash that's being done private has gone through the roof on expenses. Nothing can be done to pass that through. Again, utilities, the insurance industry on properties, commercially, I'm sure those that own homes are seeing that in their personal um, insurances. I mean, expenses are huge. And, you know, these not being able to get what little bit of rent increases have come through and capping them, having them be flat for three years, it's, it's affecting people's lives. There's no question about it. And to the next motion and, and all with the, with the billions of dollars and the fraud, I have a personal tenant that didn't pay for two years. The person's capable of getting a job. And we hear nothing about job availability. Well, why, why should they not get a job and, and pay their rent? It, it's, the system is providing and weaning these people. And it's, it's I'm, I'm all you know, support someone that really was impacted. And I have tenants that were truly impacted as well, dry cleaners and fitness people, and they couldn't operate their businesses. There's a lot of people that can get jobs and there's there's availability. And, you know, to the, to the point about expense, expenses are real. And not every landlord, it's like a lot was pushed on the landlords and landlords aren't all banks. Everyone thinks landlord, you have unlimited like you're some kind of ATM machine and it's, it's really not that way. And people have set up their retirement on things and all this. And, and suddenly government is just telling you what your net income should be or, or how to operate it when you plan maybe for 20, 30 years. And suddenly it's a whole nother ball game. So it, it is, it is a challenge and, and the landlords have not, you know, gotten a whole lot of help. Um, there were some assistance programs, but um, that money didn't really flow through to the landlord. So um, I, I think the help is going, you know, in the odd direction. I think there's a new, a new ordinance as well to that's making its way through the city. I think I just saw where the taxpayers will pay for all the tenants' attorneys' fees to fight eviction. And if it's a rightful eviction, I think that's it, it should be heard. But seemingly, rather than tie up the courts and pay all these attorney's fees, we should just pay these people's rents and move on with 
what is productive, not trying to fight the landlord, let, let the person live and let the landlord get his income and move on. So it, it's, it's very confusing to navigate, um, you know, who's, who's winning and losing, but the landlords are, are certainly have their, you know, nails clipped here and, and some of them big and the big ones. Yeah. They can withstand it more. Um, but there are a lot of little ones and people in, in a lot smaller buildings that are, are truly impacted. So thank you. Who, who paused the recording? Some, uh, someone who's a, uh, that was me by accident. Ah, okay. Uh, so I'll just uh, echo without going into a, a long speech. I'll echo what Dean and Jeff said. I agree with that. Uh, Adele, and then we'll vote, I hope. I just want to say, and while I know that not all landlords have deep pockets or whatnot, but, and you, you're talking about costs going up, well, costs are going up for everyone. I mean, costs are going up for people who rent apartments. Food is ridiculous. You know, gas prices went crazy for a while. I mean, it's not just the landlords who have that problem. And I think the reason for this motion is to ensure that landlords don't just evict people without thinking about it, you know, and I think, you know, so, I mean, I don't know, because I'm I'm not well versed in this, but I, I think there's both sides to the story, um, too. And for sure, if someone's not paying their rent, they and they can full on get a job, that's, that's a not a good situation. But I mean, I think, I think that this, which is already signed in, is to protect people from, uh, you know, to, to protect people and not to create some more homelessness in our community. So I, I'm just on the other side. Of I, I agree. And I, 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 I think, unfortunately, there's been very little accountability mm. for the tenants to have to provide their hardship. And money was passed out, and you know we all have to report to somebody something, be accountable, and it's just so easy to say, "I'm COVID affected, done." And and like I say, I know there's real hardship out there, but it just caters to so much fraud um, and no accountability, and that's that's the frustrating part, you know, as a taxpayer landlord what have you um it would and, and some of the new law actually does provide for some accountability but there was very little accountability and and billions of dollars just passed out and you know that that spending and not paying rent also drove the inflationary you know situation that you know so we, what you're it, saying is this bill this thing could actually have someone who didn't pay rent and get given then given a whole bunch of money by the landlord so that they could move somewhere else no it, it, it the bill itself is is i think designed for as you said someone a landlord to pay someone to move and then take the rent wherever they want to whatever level they want and so i i can't understand exactly where that's going for the landlord or what that's it's a lot of economics um and it, it probably each case is going to be different and mm -hmm. some tenants will take the, the payout and they'll go find housing for significantly less it's a windfall for them and and some may adopt that you know some may you know try to fight it or what but you know there's, there's a lot of different scenarios of of how these each scenario can play out adele i see your side of it you know i think if if i was paying you know twenty seven hundred dollars a month in my rent and it got raised to three thousand dollars and i'm like i can't pay that and they give me 10 grand and i've got it at least i've got a way to move um, how far I'm going to have to move to get the same rent I already had, that's another question. But when you get a new place, right, if you're renting, you got to pay first and last month, usually in a deposit. So that that's not really a windfall, probably. It's it's enough to move and, and get into a new place at the same rate you already had. So it's something uh, 
to help people, but I also understand, you know, from the business point of view, you've heard their, their arguments. So I think it's, it's just however you feel about it, you know, and it did pass. So it's, it's already law, but we can say if we oppose it or not. By the way, they, those tenants going out would, I'm certain, be refunded their security deposit in their current building to apply to whatever the next. Yes, yeah, so maybe they're making a few bucks, you know. Chip? Yeah, it's, I mean, <clears throat> it seems to me that the smaller <clears throat> landlords, the ones that Dean was talking about, are going to get killed by this. But the larger equity owned organizations can afford to take the bottom 20% of their tenants who have been there a long time and who may be paying rent that is significantly below market. So let's say to Julie's example that the average rent is 2,700 and you have 10 or 20% of your units that are going for two grand. You can buy them out, throw them to the curb and therefore raise that 20% of your units now up to market rate. If the market rate's now 3,000, you're getting a 50% increase in the monthly rent for that 20% that's your bottom tier of rent paying clients. So, I mean, this seems to me, it's just tragic, I think, this went through because, you know, I don't have one because I didn't plan well enough. But if I had a four or six apartment building that I was going to retire on, I would be getting the hardships that Dean's talking about. Whereas someone like a Midwood, you know, these big companies can end up churning the inventory to maximize their return, just taking these people and using them as pawns. And you could probably write off the deficit as a business expense for this year. So they're being protected on the other side from the tax standpoint. I mean, that's flawed. Mr. President, may, may I share my screen and show yeah. the ordinance? Because I think it's something we should put on our website sure. just to um, educate people. Let's see it. This is the final right here. Let me hide favorite bars here. So basically, this is the ordinance. A, B, C, and D, there is a section two right here about being unconstitutional, but this is what we're talking about right here, where um, A, um, I think C would be relocation assistance under the section shall be three times the fair market rent in the Los Angeles metro area plus $1,411 in moving costs. I don't know how they figure that one out. Um, this is the actual law that's going into effect um section 16509 to article 5. so there it is right there um there you go b, b is pretty interesting because there's a lot of landlords with accumulated <laughs> non-payment of rent right they, they don't even have to come out of pocket they already did by virtue of not receiving the rent if i'm reading it correctly but i could see what you guys are saying how the big companies, in the short term, they lose money. In the long term, they make a lot of money. So I can see what you guys are saying on this. And then there's down here. Oh, that's an interesting clause. So there's that. But this is the um, this is the ordinance that's going in. So might be something we might like to share with the stakeholders just to make them aware of it. So one of the perverse incentives of rent control, which this is, uh, many landlords, property owners, will defer raising their rent on a tenant because they have a good tenant and they want that tenant to stay there. <laughs> and what this incentivizes is the yearly maximum increase <coughs> in rent so you don't fall behind and then have to play catch up should things change. Uh, it also cuts down on maintenance. It also, I mean, this is just simply rent control. And who wants to be a property owner after they tighten the screws even tighter? So instead of apartments, there'll be perhaps more condominiums and things such as that. So, I mean, it's just a, 
it, I don't believe there's a city anywhere where rent control has actually had the desired effect. It it doesn't work. It, it's it, it's it's an economical uh, misnomer. And then Adele, you mentioned you know uh, supermarkets, their prices go up too. So if you take it to its logical conclusion, there would be uh, a top down price increase in, imposed upon supermarkets, gas stations, uh, utility, everything else would also have to be, it would be like a Nixon wage and price freeze from the seventies. And for those of us who were around then- we, Carter. That, that didn't, well, Nixon started it. <laughs> that, that didn't work. And it was some, you know, it, it wasn't his idea. It was the economists. They tried to curb what's happening now with, Price, uh, price and wage freezes, and here we go with uh, with more price freezes. I mean, it's 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 price control. So anyway, I think we're ready. Yes, let's vote. Okay, so we're voting on item three D. Kim Clements. Yes. Dean Cutler. No. Fiona Duffy is absent. Randa Freed, absent. Ara Gold. No. Jeff Harwick. Um, I, I just want to clarify. Um, a yes vote means you're opposing the ordinance, correct? Correct. Okay, in that case, yes, I oppose the ordinance. So I will vote yes. Julie Houlihan. Yes. Scott Mendel. Yes, I oppose the audit, the ordinance. Uh, Chip Meehan. Yes. Brandon Marino. Yes. Richard Nitterberg is absent. Rancero is absent. Adele Slutter. Yes. Adam Summer is absent. Alexa Steimer absent. Abby Velasco, yes. Abby, hold on. Ira's got his hand up. Ira, are we going to change your vote? Yeah, I got to clarify. Sorry, I haven't really slept in three days. So, yes. Yes, I believe. Um, yes. Okay. One second. So, Ira switching from no to yes? Correct. Uh, okay, excellent. So, we only have one no. And two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yes. So motion passes on opposing. Okay. All right, final motion. Okay. The Board of the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports Council File 23 0104 to establish a small housing provider assistance program to provide payment directly to housing providers who incurred debt due to rental arrears during the course of the pandemic and report on program parameter recommendations. The fund would provide rental debt assistance for the small and local housing providers in this city who otherwise may never recover lost rental income, could resort to selling property to corporations or may lose property to foreclosures for their own unpaid mortgages. This motion is also to be submitted as a separate community impact statement to council file 23-0104. And just to add to that, the fund that they set aside is $10 million and I should have put that in the motion. My apologies for that. It's, it's $10 million, which actually doesn't sound like a whole lot of money, but that's what it is. And I think we've already heard comments as to, you know, the fact that a lot of people, individuals have received rental assistance during the pandemic, but very few landlords have, and a lot of them haven't gotten paid. So we think this is a motion we're supporting. This has not passed yet, has not been voted on yet. So it is a, a timely motion. Mr. President, would you like her to put in the $10 million before we go to comments so we don't have to amend it? Or do you think it's necessary? Julie, was it important to put the $10 million in there or does it matter? I don't think it's essential. Um, it's in the council file. It's interesting, yeah. It doesn't need to, I don't, I don't think it needs to be repeated. That's up to you, Julie. 
I, I'm fine with it how it is. Okay. Oh. Public comment on what you just heard read. Anyone from the public, please raise your hand. Not seeing any hands. Back to the board. Any board comments? Kim, go ahead. Wasn't there already, wasn't this already worked out in that the people who were affected by COVID or did not pay rent, that, that things were worked out with the landlords so that if they forgave a certain amount of rent, perhaps then they, they, the whole thing was covered. So weren't the landlords made at least partially whole again uh, already? Is my question. I don't know if you really know, Julie. It seems to me a duplicate of like that was already taken care of. Because the money didn't go straight to the uh to the renters who were in arrears. <laughs> um I can't answer your question, unfortunately. Thanks. That was it. So, Jeff. I'll look in the motion just quickly to see if, if there's anything in there about that. Yeah, to kind of reiterate my last point, uh, 1.6 billion in rental assistance by the city of LA was provided during a pandemic to renters, uh, 27.6 million to eviction defense programs, and um, not a penny really to the mom and pops who are struggling during a pandemic to survive as well. So I, I'm generally opposed to these government handouts like this but it's only $10 million and at least it'll level the playing field given the fact that the other side has received so much government and taxpayer money. Uh, so I support this particular measure. Thank you. Ira? I think everyone's getting shafted with rent control and, and the way rent is. Uh, I think tenants, it's tough for tenants to afford. Look, at, some people are just fortunate and some people are not. And that's through hard work and sometimes it's not. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, it's just, that's just the way it is. I'm seeing uh, a, a lot of, you know, we're talking about the mom pops, pops specifically. You know, a lot of mom pops, yes, they did receive some funds from what I understand, but they're, they're, they still have to pay, they have to pay the mortgage. They have to pay property taxes, which is like one and a quarter percent of the property. They assess property value a year. They have to pay for anything that tenants may or may not do to the property. They have to pay for maintenance. They have to pay all these things. So while I, what I, I, I am a renter myself and my, I'm not in a rent control building and my, my rent went up hundreds of dollars. Uh, and, and it, it, it's, it's, is it fair? I can't say it's not fair because the, the 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 owners have to make money and and they've worked really hard to to buy again ma and pops they've worked really hard to buy these properties so i i still feel like a lot of legislation is is in place to almost criminalize and penalize the the people who have who are, are fortunate and again not for not for lack of uh work or work ethic i'm not putting down anybody's work ethic whether they have money or don't have money right but it it's it's really it's really unfortunate and 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 for me if this ever if my rent ever goes up high enough where i feel like it's a little too high for my budget i'm not entitled to live where i live i live where i live because i'm able to afford to live where i live because i work to do it and i've been fortunate in my work choices and my work results so I, I, I don't know, again, this is maybe three days, hopefully this is coherent and cohesive. This is a lot of lack of sleep going on here, um, but this is really difficult, but hey, anything, but I think in, in the end, um, yes, it's really difficult for renters. Nobody wants to be evicted. Nobody wants to all of a sudden have to, 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 to have their rent raised, but that was in the contract that, I signed that was in the contract that people signed. It's not like necessarily a surprise if they're on a month to month. And at the same time, the landlords, the owners, they have a right to earn an income on something that they worked or were able to afford. So anything that goes back into either pocket, I'm happy for it. But also let's not criminalize the people who are fortunate enough to be able to, by any means, achieve uh 
property. Thank you. Yeah, and these are for people who own like four or more, four or fewer units. It's very small. Ten, ten. Kim, go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead, Kim. Sorry. Just, just a quick, because uh, I'm still, and I realize Jeff doesn't have the the numbers there and, and whatever he was looking at, but the 1.6 billion in rental assistance, I think that it did go to help the landlords. So that that really is where I mean, I wish we had a hard number on that. Is I I wouldn't put it past the city or the state to put it into the hands of the renters, uh, and and it wouldn't get to the landlords. So that that is quite possible, but. But if the money has gone there already to the landlords, I'm not sure why we're doing this. That that's that's my big stick here. If anybody has any, I think input to that. in the motion here it says 1.6 billion in rental assistance were provided to City of Los Angeles renters through the city's emergency rental assistance program and the California Housing is Key program. So it doesn't mean it went directly to renters. What what is this new fund, by the way? How much? It, it just means it helped the it helped the renters not be in arrears. It doesn't mean it went into their hands, though. I believe it went to the landlords. It well, went to help catch up. I will tell you that um, part, housing is key was for tenants and landlords, but it was money that was funded, and landlords could apply to. Um, and the tenants were given money, and part of their contract was they had to forward the money they received to the landlord. And not all tenants, including mine, I know they received money and didn't forward the money. Um, and that was punishable, but there's no enforcement. So that's a separate that? that's a Thank separate you. issue. Thank you, Dean. You got to the to the nitty gritty of it. That's exactly what I foresaw was that it wouldn't have gotten into the hands, but got yeah, given to I, some did do the right thing and said, hey, wow, I'm I'm getting this money. I'm gonna my rents get being paid under this program. I'm gonna pay my landlord and maintain that relationship, et cetera, et cetera. But there was, as I said earlier, a lot of fraud and there there was no enforcement or accountability of the money. And and I do have a tenant that that did receive money and I, you know, I, I don't know what to do about it or if I'm going to do anything about it, but, um, you know, there was a lot of money that did flow through the landlords, but rightfully so that that's those tenants were, you know, needing to pay rent and, and, or work out circumstances, but some of them, you know, and there's still a lot of rent out there owed that is on the books. And these tenants were never, they never said you don't have to pay. There's a lot of tenants and that that ship is out there on the sea. And there's a program within the ordinances that says rent during a certain period of time from 21 clear up to 22 is, I think, um, due and payable by February of 24. And no one knows what's going to happen with when that push comes to shove in a way it may get extended. It may who knows what. But I'm sure the courts are going to be clogged up even more. But but um, this new program in Motion E, did I hear something about 10 million? It says here, can I just say, it says to establish a minimum 10 million small housing provider assistance program to provide payment directly to housing providers who incurred debt due to rental arrears during the course of the pandemic. So it same minimum. So I guess it could be more. <laughs> yeah. Th so that's going True. not going to go to the renters. It's going to go to the housing provider to to you, the landlord. So yes. Yeah. No pass through. So, I mean, there no could pass. be a double. There could be a double payment here because the the money that the tenants got that didn't get forwarded to the landlord. Now the landlords that are going to go claim they didn't get the money are going to collect from the fund when the tenant received the money, but didn't forward it. Brandon? Yeah, just a reminder to everybody, the um, the increase, the yearly increase, um, inflation increase, the, whatever they call it, three, 4%, whatever it is, did not happen this year. It's pushed until next year. So there was no increase in 21, 22, or 23. So you add those up, 
that's a lot of money for the landlords that they lost over the past three years. So, um, yeah, there's a lot going on. The landlords do have um, resources. Um, I don't know how many they have, but there are there are programs to assist landlords, and of course, their businesses. And if they establish their business properly, they have um, resources for that too. LLCs, corporations, so on and so forth. But um, yeah, the landlords are getting pinched as well. Um, yeah. And I'm a renter. I, I like where I live, and yeah, I mean, I went. I don't really want to see my rent going up. Nobody really does, but I get it and that it does Perfect. cost. And, and I think the, the larger argument here is um, the city making it easier for people to own property in the city of LA rather than making it more difficult. And that's a, that's a larger conversation that nobody wants to talk about. You know, why is it so difficult to own property? Why is it so difficult to be a landlord in the city of Los Angeles, a bureaucracy of it all, all these little you know, was that Terry Austin quote, uh, death of a thousand cuts you guys were mentioning earlier? And that's exactly what this is. And I think the larger picture here is the city is just killing the small market, the, 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 the mom and pop landlords and um, catering to the IMTs of the world. And um, it's unfortunate. That's all I have to say. Well, yeah, the, 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 it's expensive to live whether you own or rent. And, and costs are going up. And, and as I mentioned earlier about the landscape, I mean, all of us, you know, depending where, where you are, but, you know, labor and wages have gone up and gardeners and are charging more and pool men are charging more and everyone is, is passing it on, um, you know, from the mark, from like Adele says, the market, everything costs more. And so they're passing it on and trying to, you know, get more wages. That's why we've seen minimum wage go up so high. Um, you know, clear up into $22, $25. There, there's some incredible jobs out there at, at some great corporations. People can go earn $25 an hour. That was unheard of. Um, and and sadly, it's still hard to make a living, you know, with such a huge wage increase um, to live in the city. It's, it's, it's not a good... Uh, it's not a good thing going forward. It's it's a big challenge. A lot of people are, that's why they're thinking and, and are, frankly, leaving the city and the state. True. I think we are ready to vote on this. We are. So the vote is to support the fund, the $10 million fund for mom and pop landlords. A yes vote supports it. Yes. Okay, so we are, are we voting on item 3E? Yes. Yeah, that's 3E, I'm sure. Kim Clements. Yes. Dean Cutler. Yes. Fiona Duffy is absent, Randa Freed absent, Aragol. Yes. Jeff Harwick. Yes. Julie Houlihan. Yes. Scott Mendel. Yes. Chief Meehan. Yes, but I don't know how we're going to pay for it. Brenda Marino. Yes. Richard Nitterberg is absent. Rincero is absent. Adele Slutter. Yes. Adam Summer is absent. Alexa Steinberg absent. Abby Velasco, yes. Motion passes. Fantastic. Well, thank, thank you all, the 10 of you, for showing up so we could get this unfinished business out of the way in our last virtual meeting. So thank you for showing up. Thank you to the one attendee from the public who stuck it out to the very end. We start in-person meetings tomorrow with Jeff Hartwick in public safety. So come to the lot and let's experience an in-person meeting. And on that note, we will call this meeting adjourned if I don't see or hear any objections at 8.55 p.m. Signing off on Zoom forever. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.